Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Welcome to this uh, Monday of our Green Week. Um, we're very fortunate that we've got uh, our keynote speaker, uh, as Brian Eversham, who's Chief Executive of the Local Wildlife Trust. Um, very long association between the Wildlife uh, Trust and uh, the University, particularly on the acad academic side of things. Um, but we're very keen going forwards um, to develop the biodiversity of this campus, so we're very much hoping that we'll put the big one like trust the brains on, on that side of things as well. Um, so, yeah, without any further ado, I'm sure Brian can introduce himself. I'll pass you over. Thanks very much indeed. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm most impressed to have an audience, partly because I feel the timing of this place is really, really difficult. That if it's a little bit later, you'd have all gone home and wouldn't want to come back. And if it's a little bit earlier, you'd all have lectures or be out doing stuff. So it's great to see a full room. Um, I should say, climate change is one of those topics which I will always talk about when given a chance. About 12 years ago now, at a conference we were on climate change, we all had to sign a pledge card and come up with something that we would pledge to do. And the one I signed it to was never turn down the opportunity to talk about climate change. So when I was invited here, then as long as the timing could work, I really had to be here. Now, my guess is that most of you know pretty great, a great deal about climate change already. And what I'd like to do is just give a slightly different take on it from primarily a local wildlife perspective, but taking a longer time scale on wildlife as well, to give a sense that things are changing quite rapidly already, that this isn't it might happen in the future scenario, it's what's already taking place right here in Bedfordshire. So I'll talk a bit about the history of Bedfordshire wildlife, a little bit about the latest predictions, though my guess is that many of you are better read on that subject than I am, so I'll skip over that fairly quickly. Talk a fair bit about the species responses to climate change, a bit about how it has impact, then a little bit about how the wildlife trusts are responding to climate change, and some of that I think will actually be relevant to any serious landowner and here in the middle of a rather extensive campus, I see you as a major landowner who has things to offer. So the starting point for me is that the climate has been changing for a long time. This is sea surface temperature, I think, I think is one of the more robust uh, geochemical measures. The basic message is brief warm periods with full ice ages in between, about eight ice ages in the last million years, about 20 ice ages in three million years. And with each of those, what the other thing to note about this graph is the horizontal lines. The rate of climate change at the beginning and end of ice ages is almost instantaneous. Uh, if you look at the history of the study of um, climate and plant and animal species, 20, 30 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, there was still talk about the climate optimum, the idea that at the end of an ice age it took 7,000 years to warm up and then it cooled down again. This was based on pollen analysis and looking at the rate of recolonization of tree species at the end of an ice age. Um, in the mid-1970s, people started looking at beetle remains in relation to climate change and discovered that however finely you could slice your lake sediments or your peats, you move from a full glacial beetle fauna to a warmer than present fauna in as thin a slice as you could take. So that uh, people back in the mid-70s were saying, well, ice age is actually stop and start within 100 years, within 50 years, within 20 years? And then the ice chemists came along, looked at the Greenland ice core and the rate of snow deposition, and said snowfall in Greenland had moved from three to four metres a year to zero in less than five years. In other words, within the life of one British government, you move from full ice age to warmer than present or vice versa. Something like a 16 or 17 degree rise in summer temperatures. Hence, horizontal lines. Now, from a wildlife perspective, I think this has given us a bit of good news. All the species living in Bedfordshire today have had to move down to the Mediterranean and back again about 20 times in the last three million years. So that all the species you see around us that have made it back to Bedfordshire naturally have the dispersal ability to get from southern Europe to Bedfordshire, back to southern Europe, and so forth, repeatedly. That suggests that even our most sedentary species actually are capable of moving long distances relatively quickly. Now, at the end of the last ice age, it was a little bit easier than it is today. Britain was still attached to the continent, and species could simply walk back. So you've had a 100,000-year warm holiday around the Mediterranean, you stroll back across France, stroll across the Channel, and right across pristine post-glacial Britain. 
This time around, there are two or three important differences. The first one is that for the first time, probably in 60 million years, the temperature is going up from a warm period. Now, we've not played that game before, and none of the species on the planet today have actually existed in conditions of that increased temperature. We're going back way beyond present species. Next problem, the channel is there, London is there, the motorway network is there, the conurbations and the industrial agriculture group is there. So the countryside is carved up into inhospitable gaps between small packets of reasonable habitat. So this time around, species responding to climate change are going to be struggling. They're moving through this man-made, this human fragmented landscape. Now the second bit of good luck in this story is the network of protected areas in Britain. Our national nature reserves, our sites of special scientific interest, and the beginning of the wildlife trust movement all date from the 1950s, just before industrial agriculture coated the countryside with artificial pesticides, fertilizers, etc. So that we have this network of several thousand sites which escaped post-war industrial agriculture. So we have these pristine islands of good habitats, many of which are now wildlife trust nature reserves, which there give you these little islands in that sea of fairly hostile territory. To give you a small uh, sort of microcosm of this, case study around one of our large area projects, the Great Fen, which I'll say a bit more about in a few minutes. The big story that people tend to have heard about, with the Sumir, this area around there, was the largest lake in Lower Britain, drained in 1851. And as a result of that drainage, several species became extinct in Britain, many more became extinct in eastern and central England, but some survived in the small mirrors within what's now Home Fair National Nature Reserve. So human destruction of wild habitats, species surviving in the smaller patches that still survive. Less famous but equally significant, Huntington Fen was actually the last piece of decent acidic heathland in the Cambridge of Fens. Many heathland species became extinct when that was ploughed up in the 1930s, but some of them survived from the acidic soils at the southern end of Wood Walton Fen Nature Reserve. So the basic story over the last two and a half, three, maybe four thousand years is British landscapes gradually been simplified, semi-natural habitats have been destroyed. Uh, interesting fact to bear in mind, most of the woodland clearance in Britain had happened before the Romans arrived. So 2,000 years ago, most of Edwidge and Cambridge was already open land under some form of cultivation or grazing. And that process has continued to the present day, with wildlife surviving in smaller and smaller fragments of semi-natural habitat. Now, as to climate change, it's throwing further problems on top of that fragmented landscape. Latest statistics, and I think the UN's pronouncements this week confirm this, there is very, very little prospect that climate change is not strongly influenced by people. I think the time of denying that it's happening or denying that people play a part in it is long gone. And governments are starting to believe that, even if they're not willing to do anything against it. In a British context, Mike, for the uh, younger members of the audience, this white stuff is snow, and it used to fall in these winters. <laughs> Most recent British predictions are telling us overall warmer, but a bigger temperature increase in summer than in winter. Little overall change in rainfall, but um, wetter winters, drier summers. More storms, more summer droughts. And the scary one, which I really don't like to think too much about, is based on the mid-scenario of a two degree temperature rise, up to half a metre of sea level rise. Now, living and working in Cambridge, where much of the land isn't half a metre above sea level, that is potentially a problem. If we do something about climate change right now, we might still, with a little bit of luck, still be within the two, two degree centigrade ceiling of what natural systems might possibly be able to cope with. If we do nothing, then we could be looking at a four or six degree rise and anything up to a four meter sea level rise. My own sense is that as soon as you get beyond the two to two and a half degree level, then the changes are well beyond anything that we can model satisfactorily. And the predictions become more and more sketchy, but the scale of it, we're there talking about tens of millions of climate change refugees from southern Europe heading this way. Globally we're talking maybe a thousand million displaced people, so it's a pretty serious threat. In that context, I've almost been guilty about giving you a talk about local wildlife 
on the back of this. But uh, I'll give you one story that actually convinces me that certainly in a British context, this is not a bad approach to take. I give lots of talks about climate change to local businesses, rotary clubs, chambers of commerce, and such like. And talking to hard bitten, mostly middle aged businessmen, I can say as much as I like about changes across the planet and hundreds of millions of climate change refugees, and get no response. If I talk about their grandchildren not being able to walk through Bluebird I've actually made real men cry. There's some connection with local wildlife that actually allows you to get through to people who are immune to the headlines that they read on a regular basis. So, in that context, a bit about habitat change and then we'll get onto the species side of things. The sorts of changes we're expecting to see within one generation, I would guess, is fires within most habitats. We're already seeing heathland fires in southern England on a more regular basis. The first few grassland fires have happened within recent years. My guess is that within my lifetime, we'll see forest fires in the scale that we've probably not done for two or 3,000 years. Wetlands drying up, rivers drying up, which has not happened within recorded time. And in, the, in an ecological context, more disturbance and less stable habitats. Uh, for the ecologists here, I'd be talking about early successional stages. If you're not an ecologist and you don't know what an early successional stage is, imagine a newly dug flower bed or a newly ploughed field. Bare ground, ready to be colonised by species that can move in quickly and can take advantage of that bare disturbed habitat. Some species are adapted to move in, reproduce quickly and take over a patch. Other species are adapted to slow successional change to stable habitats. And it's those less stable ancient habitats that are going to be the biggest concern for a high proportion of British wildlife. Now, it's quite difficult to predict which species will benefit or will suffer from a rise in temperature, particularly in a small offshore island like Britain, and particularly as most of our modelling focuses on temperature, and yet rainfall may turn out to be at least as strong a factor in determining how species respond. But as a very rough Rule of thumb, in the Northern Hemisphere, species which already have a northern distribution to their range are likely to decline and move further north. Upland and montane species are likely to contract further north and further up. Southern and lowland species might be expected to expand, and we'd expect a lot more species to colonise Britain from further south in mainland Europe. The big if, this assumes those species can actually make the journey. And a few examples that you if you've been in Bedford for very long, you may have noticed the absence of mountain hares. <laughs> uh, we lost those about 30,000 years ago at the end of last ice age. Um, that just makes the point there are many species that would have been here when Bedfordshire was under permafrost that are not here now. Wildlife response to climate change, no big deal there. But what we might not have thought about is the last lingering species on the southern edges of the range. This cute little plant is called uh, mountain of elastic or cat's paw, and the most southerly sites in Britain used to be on the North Chilterns, a few miles from here. Those sites are now gone. The, the most southerly site in Britain these days is in the north of my patch near Peterborough at Barnack, Hills and Hills, a national nature reserve. It may be able to survive there through adequate gardening, in the same way as gardeners can keep almost any plant growing anywhere if they put in enough time and effort and money. But natural populations of cat's paw are going to disappear from the lowlands of Britain. Uh, looking at the background there is a small bit of horsetail. Ferns and horsetails are sport producing plants whose reproductive cycle, one, I don't have time to talk about their sex life in much detail, but suffice to say they need just the amount, right amount of water at certain key times of year. And what climate change is already doing is disrupting those patterns of rainfall and drought so that most ferns and horsetails are already in retreat and disappearing from the southeast of Britain. And there are the cute beetle, you may get one or two more beetles this evening if you're lucky. Uh, that is one of the metallic um, click beetles, currently survive on the Green Sand Ridge in Bedfordshire and on some of the acid soils in the western North Hands, but within 20 or 30 years may well have disappeared from the whole of the lowlands, and you'd have to go up to the Pennines up to maybe two, three hundred metres altitude to find that species. Ah, that's a whole step so you can see what this amazing plant is. That, that particular species is already extinct in Bedfordshire and it's down to just two sites in North Hans, so that's going fairly fast. On the other hand, there are species that are doing really rather well. The bird at the top right, the Dartford warbler, uh, as a teenage bird orchard growing up in northern England, I'd have to travel almost to the south coast, to Hampshire, Dorset or Surrey, 
to see Dartford warblers back in the 1970s and 80s. They now breed regularly um, in East Anglia, in Norfolk and Suffolk. They've bred as far north as Cheshire. So that in 30 years they've increased their geographic range by about 200 miles. Similarly, the wasp spider, large, brightly coloured, very distinctive, uh, egg cocoons almost as big as golf balls, very easily recognisable animal, not easy to mistake, colonised Britain in the 1930s, and for half a century lived within about five miles of the south coast. In the late 1980s, it began moving north. By the mid 90s, it had crossed the River Thames and got into Bedfordshire. It's now recorded as far north as Derbyshire and Yorkshire. So, again, something like a 200 mile range expansion in the last 30 years. Adonis blue butterfly is the brightest blue of all our butterflies, moving this way fast, not yet into Bedfordshire, but it's advancing through Buckinghamshire on the North Chilterns. It'll be over the border into Bedfordshire probably within 10 or 20 years. And the bee wolf. Uh, a solitary wasp that uh, hunts and uh, kills honeybees, feeds them to each young. Uh, when I was working on the Red Data book, book of British Insects back in the 1980s, the bee wolf was known from three sites in Dorset, very, very close to the south coast of England. Uh, it was given protected status on the basis it was so rare. It's now abundant as far north as central England, so you can find it on the Green Sand Ridge in Bedford, a site like Cooper's Hill, you can go and see bee wolves. Uh, on the Suffolk coast, sites like Minsmere and uh, right the way around to the North Norfolk coast now, we have bee wolves forming large colonies and feeding on honeybees. So again, a range expansion of uh, maybe 150 miles and moving from tiny populations to really quite big populations over quite large geographic areas. And all of these species are those with that southern range distribution. We've also seen species colonising Britain over the last 20, 30, 40 years. If next spring you see a bumblebee that is orangey brown at the front, blackish in the middle, and white at the rear end, that is the tree bumblebee. First bred in Britain in 2000, and is now probably the most abundant bumblebee in the southern half of England. It's also our only bumblebee that nests in hollow trees or in bird nesting boxes. So if you see bumblebees flying in and out of a blue tip box, then it's going to be the tree bumblebee opposite Norham. Recent colonists are now plentiful, right as far north as the Scottish border. Um, this weird thing here, those two structures there would have been a little bud on an oak twig like that. They've been taken over by a parasitic wasp. The wasp eggs transform that into this weird antler-shaped structure. And this, the ram's horn gall, is one of a dozen or more species of plant parasites, galls, which have colonised Britain in the last decade. The uh, white heron up top there is actually a cattle egret, but I've got to pick almost any European species of heron. Uh, back in the 1980s, we just had two heron species breeding in Britain. We had the grey heron that you see all around you, and the bittern, which is a rare species within the reed beds in East Anglia. In the last 20 years, little egret has colonised and is now widespread, so you will see small white herons on the edge of most large lakes in this part of the world. Cattle egrets bred, furful heron has bred, little egret has bred, uh, uh, little bittern has bred, spoonbills have bred. We've now got virtually the whole set of European heron species, which 30 years ago you'd have had to go down to central France to see, and now successfully breeding within Britain. Uh, great white heron isn't breeding yet, but there are pairs prospecting on half a dozen sites in Britain, so they will be established within a few years. And one of the weirdest and most peculiar, this beast here, sand covered with enormous jaws, uh, those of you who have read Gerald Durham as a child may have come across amphions. Uh, again, as a, a young entomologist in Britain, I saw amphions as one of those exotic things you found when you went further south in Europe. They're now breeding on about a 50 mile stretch of the East Anglian coast. They arrived in the 1990s. They seem to be spreading by about five miles per year, so if they can do that through networks of river valleys and gravel pits, they could reach the Bedfordshire greensand within 30 or 40 years. So ant lions having colonised Britain are now well established and are spreading. And these are things which Britons would have regarded as absolutely exotic and peculiar and southern European just a couple of decades ago. Now for the breeding birds, we've got much more detail starting modelling. There are some very good common methods of breeding bird ranges across Europe. Uh, the models can predict the current distribution of species from current climate uh, with something like a 90% accuracy, so that the future uh, we can be reasonably confident the predictions are likely to work too. It's predicting 12 extinctions of mostly northern and upland species of birds, 
30 species to decline, and 10 of those are already on the way out. 20 expansions and 53 colonists were predicted, and this book only came out about seven years ago. Of the 20 predicted expansions, eight are already increasing, and of the 53 new colonists, 10 have already bred at least once. And some of them are quite exciting. The northern ones, it's sad. Most of these are species that have always had a fairly tentative foothold in the north of Scotland anyway. Um, the really sad one, I suspect, is the Scottish crossbill, which is an endemic species found only in Scotland. So that unless people intervene, it's very unlikely Scottish crossbill will colonise anywhere else. So when it disappears from Scotland, it will be globally extinct. I've mentioned the um, fast emergence of all the um, herons and egrets. Um, there are species in other groups as well. Bee eaters, hoopoes, blue throats are exotic sounding, exotic looking birds, which we tend to think of as what you see on Mediterranean holidays. And they're starting to breed in England on a more regular basis. And the wilder claims of the predictive atlas tell us that wall creepers should be breeding on the um, south coast of the Isle of Wight and the Channel. Short toed eagles should be able to breed about as far north as the River Thames. Great spotted cuckoo and parasite in the nests of magpies should breed up to the River Thames, and little buster could breed right across East Anglia. And I thought these sounded a bit odd, uh, particularly with um, short toed eagle, a feeder on lizards and snakes. And that will never occur in Britain. And then you visit the south coast, the Dorset, the Isle of Wight, and see um, introduced populations of green lizard and wall lizard forming huge population densities. So whereas a native lizard, you see the old one or two, and the idea of a fairly large bird of prey feeding on them would be quite tricky. On the south coast, we're now getting the population densities of lizards that we associate with hot sunny places in southern Europe. So my guess is that actually that might even work out. So none of those, exotic though they look, is beyond the bounds of possibility. And if you try to work out the winners and the losers and how things are going to progress, I say it's very difficult to make species-specific predictions, but below the red line are a random selection of species that I think are likely to be doing well and expanding. Above the line, the ones we're likely to be losing. Um, the small bird there, the willow tit, has already dis disappeared from the southern half of England in the last 30 years. It still breeds as far south as Yorkshire, but even there, the population is already in decline. And the red line is there to signify that in Britain, at least, about 80% of our species have southern and eastern distributions, and only about 20% of species in the majority of groups have northern and western distributions. So if the landscape permitted, something like 80% of our wildlife should expand its range in response to climate change, and only 20% would be in the doomed category that would be expected to decline. There are one or two whole groups of organisms in that top category. They tend not to be things that people care about very much, sadly. So, ferns and horsetails I've mentioned, crane flies would be another group, um, sedges would be another group, mosses and liverworts would group with strong northern and western biases in the distribution. Um, I don't find a huge public response when I say that our mosses could be really struggling under climate change. When we start looking at the habitats rather than just the individual species, the most vulnerable places hinted at already are the uplands. So the mountains of Bedfordshire will be a poorer place <laughs> in 50 years' time than they are today. But as I say, we've already lost our mountain hares, and most of our upland plants are actually confined to northern England, to the mountains of Scotland and Wales, where they will be under increasing pressure, and where there's very little to be done for them. You can't extend your mountains further up. So once something's living at the top of your highest mountains, it's nowhere to go. At the other extreme, salt marshes and the range of intertidal habitats will be vulnerable, partly because of sea level rise and because of the whole cell so change, so changes in coastal morphology over the next 50 or 100 years. At the moment, not a major issue from our wildlife trust covering Bedfordshire, Cambridge, and Northamptonshire. Cambridgeshire does have a salt marsh right at the northern end, uh, but we're not expecting a massive increase in Cambridgeshire salt marsh in the short term at least. The other habitats, though, which are vulnerable to changing climates are wetlands. This is with Walton Fen in the Great Fen in Cambridgeshire. It could just as easily be one of the drains that fell on some of the Bedfordshire wetlands. And those persistent summer droughts and unpredictable rainfall make most wetland habitats likely to struggle. And one of the knock-on effects of an unpredictable rainfall is going to be increases in nutrient levels. And within, within most habitats, there will be certain things that will happen. 
And that's just a sort of overview of local habitats. So in Bedfordshire, the chalk habitats are nationally important. The heathlands and the green sand, some of our lowland meadows and some of our wetlands are really important. And in most habitats, a few basic things are changing already and are going to change much more in the next 20, 30, 40 years. The longer growing season, uh, you notice it around you in the gardens. Um, 30 years ago, we had a sort of closed season for mowing grass in Britain. You didn't bother mowing the lawn after about October until about March or April. Now you see people mowing the lawn into November and starting to mow it in February. The growing season has probably expanded by about six weeks already and will get longer. What that means for a wildlife charity is that habitats that are managed by grazing, and that's basically anything that isn't covered in either mature trees or open water, so grasslands, heathlands and open wetlands, will need more livestock for longer periods to achieve the same effect on the habitat. We're already seeing a massive increase in pests and diseases. The most significant ones probably tree diseases. You'll have heard of uh, ash dieback, possibly oak wilt. There are rapid death diseases for many of our forest trees. Our landscape could be a very different place in 50 years' time if we lose oak, ash, and alder as three trees that are already threatened by lethal diseases. I mentioned fire and unpredictable rainfall. High winds can happen at strange times of the year under changing climates. And you may not have thought about this, but deciduous trees are fairly immune to high storms from now through the winter. Look outside, trees without leaves allow the wind through them. If the storms happened six weeks earlier, trees with leaves are much more likely to be blown over. Uh, the big storm in England in 1987 uh, knocked down hundreds and hundreds of thousands of trees in the southern third of England because the storm came while the trees still had their leaves on them. So they get much bigger impacts on woodlands from that. And invasive species, some arriving naturally, some introduced by people, can start having impacts. And I put a photo of Ian and Sam with it just to remind myself to mention that species behave differently if you turn the heat up. So we have a pretty clear idea of the ecology of species that live in Britain. Um, the sand lizard, a good example, is a scarce species found on high quality heathlands in the south of England, high quality sand dunes in the northwest of England, where it lays eggs in warm, bare, bare sand. If you travel to central France, you'll find it in mid length grassland. In southern France, you'll find it in rough grassland, in scrub, and beyond the edge of arable fields. In other words, by turning the temperature by two or three degrees, it breaks out of the ecological constraints that in this country says it needs high quality heathlands with bits of bare sand to say it can find the same temperature regime, particularly warm places for its eggs to be laid and to hatch. It can find those in different physical habitats. So, turn the temperature of the species may actually behave quite differently and in ways we won't always be able to predict. Very briefly, in the context in which climate change is happening, in Britain is not one of extensive semi-natural habitats and low human population densities. We've got a lot of things going on, all of which actually stem from people and our impacts. There are introduced plants and animals, mostly um, having adverse effects. Um, Emily and Balsam, tall wetland plant that will shade out native vegetation. And it's one big disadvantage here is that it's an annual plant which rots down very, very rapidly when frosted, so that you move from tall, dense shading stands with big green flowers to nothing, to bare mud. Nowhere for insects to spend the winter. Whereas native vegetation has large tussocks of things in which insects can find shelter from rising water levels, Himalayan balsam removes that. North American mink escapes or released from fur farms can eliminate water voles of ground nesting birds. Zebra mussel and its recent relative, the uh, quagga mussel, can block up um, water pipes, so the water companies hate it. They can form massive stands on top of native freshwater mussels, and they can strip out most of the um, plankton from freshwater systems so that other plankton feeding invertebrates disappear. So one species might be replacing 50 or 100 or 1,000 existing natives. But red chitin is one of the few. Had deliberate reintroductions of native species to England, which is now actually doing very well and has fitted in remarkably well. But I would say, in the British context, although there are a few uh, celebrity cases like the mink, uh, introduced species are not one of the major factors affecting wildlife. Pollution has been in the past. If I were giving a talk like this 30 years ago, I'd have been talking about acid rain, sulfur dioxide pollution. As soon as London smog started killing people on a large scale, something was done about it. 
It had eliminated lichen species from most of southern England for the previous four or five hundred years. This is actually the uh, um, cloud forest of Tenerife, but these lichens would have occurred on trees in Bedfordshire 1,200, 1,400 years ago. But by the Norman Conquest, the rise of industry in southern England was already starting to remove some of these. The good news is that one of the most sensitive species, this is a thing called um, Pomelia caparata, has recolonized the whole of central England in the last 30 years. Clean the air and species come back. Um, there was a time when the whole of the lichen flora of my three counties, Bedfordshire, County, and Hamptonshire, was less species rich than a good tree in the Welsh borders or in Scotland. We've now moved from a lichen flora of about 150 species to about 400 species in 30 years, and it's increasing the rate of maybe 30 species a year. As the air is cleaner, these species move back. Something I should have said, most of the success stories are with species that can disperse long distance very easily. Birds that fly, lichens are reproduced by spores that blow around certain probably so that spores rain down on the whole of the country. Spiders who can cast a strand of silk into the air and get carried off on rising air, and again can drift long distances and rain down, and insects that fly very well. So things that move are already responding to human activity where the opportunities arise. The big threats to wildlife in this country, though, have been the loss of habitat, um, the motorway network, the rail network, and urban sprawl is possibly the most conspicuous side of this. I would argue that agricultural change over the last hundred years has been the single biggest factor in removing species from natural habitats. Uh, this photo, which is probably just before the turn of the previous century, so maybe 1880, 1890. Several things there that are um, quite striking. Horses rather than machinery, large numbers of people, and corn that was growing about shoulder high. With plant breeding and changing agricultural practice, we moved from that to one person in a much larger field and a crop that when mature would be about knee high because we didn't need the straw anymore. That simple change has eliminated plants like corn cuckle. The red poppy is still occurring in Britain, but now occasional on roadside villages seldom do you see a whole landscape turning scarlet as the poppies flower. And that was a common sight as recently as the 1970s and 80s. So one thing, I, I put this in really to, to demonstrate two things for you. One is how rapidly species change. Look at the fact that we know the changes are taking place. This is the breeding range of silverwood in Britain in the 1890s, 1930s, 1960s, and more recently. So, once upon a time, a frequent breeding species over the southern or southwestern third of Britain, fragmented by the 60s, confined to this tiny area on the south coast by the 1990s. Intensive conservation work in the southwest has actually expanded that range about fourfold, so it will now probably extend somewhere like that after putting in a lot of effort. The main reasons it disappeared were the lack of food, and the biggest single change in British agriculture was one that took about three years to, uh, to enact, which was to move from uh, spring sown cereals to when you had the winter crops, uh, a stubble field standing over the winter with lots of weed seeds and birds to eat, to autumn sown cereals. So as soon as one crop's finished, you cultivate the land, you sow the autumn cereals, they grow, they're green through the winter and they're harvest to make summer. Uh, that completely removed the seed source for most of our flocks of seed-eating birds. So, Solvent is an extreme example, but in this part of the world, a bird like tree sparrow went from being one of the commonest birds you'd see every time we went out to a rare bird you have to go to one or two special places to see. There are whole English counties with no tree sparrows, with very few corn bunting, with very few yellow hammers. So birds that were very common until the mid-1980s disappeared within three years, given that change from um, spring sown to autumn sown cereal crops. But the reason I put that in was also to point out that Britain is the one place in the world we have, where we have detailed species recording going back to the middle of the 19th century, so that we can say these species are changing. Uh, most of my talk so far has been about species changing their distributions. There are very few places in the world where we can actually say that. Even something like that big black and yellow spider to say it was absent from central England until 1989 is quite a bold assertion, but we can be confident because there were species in every English county studying the local spider fauna in detail since the mid-19th century. So we have this historical data allowing us to demonstrate things in Britain that in the rest of the world we can only surmise. So, 
Species are changing their distributions quite rapidly. Every time you go for a walk in Bedfordshire, you will be seeing wildlife species that were not here 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. There are dozens of species colonising the area all the time. But the success story so far are for those very highly dispersive species, and a lot of wildlife does not disperse well. So the Wildlife Trust approach, which has since been mimicked by RSPB and by the National Trust, so all the conservation charities are saying, we want landscape scale conservation. We can summarize it in those three, three phrases. Bigger nature reserves, better managed with climate change in mind, and joined up in two ways, physically connected across the countryside, but also emotionally connected to people. Because one of the biggest threats to British wildlife is that most people do not see wildlife as being relevant to their daily lives. And even to say that we want to reconnect people with nature is slightly missing the point, in that people and nature are part of the same thing. If you enjoy eating food or you enjoy breathing oxygen, you are reliant on natural ecosystems. And yet, people, politicians, just don't get it. So a quick run through of what a living landscape means to the Wildlife Trust, and then think about how some of this could be implemented. The benefits of bigger nature reserves are essentially that they're cheap and easier to manage. Because if you've got a small nature reserve, you have to manage it almost like gardening. On a larger scale, though, when you think about using natural processes, that might be flood water, it might be herds of grazing animals, but we can be a bit more um, laissez-faire. We can actually let processes create the spaces within which species will thrive. And larger habitats mean larger populations mean less likely of extinction. Most species that go extinct tend to have gone to small populations first, and if we can enlarge those populations, we're making them more um, sustainable. Our top four living landscapes, here in South Bedford, from the North Chilterns, mainly calcareous grassland, but some important areas of scrub and some interesting wetlands too. The big river valley of the River Nen in Northamptonshire, the Great Fen that I've touched on already, and the West Cambridgeshire Hundreds, which is an area of ancient woodland with bluebells and oxlips and other important wildfire communities. Um, if you think West Cambridge Hundreds isn't a very sexy title, we started off calling it the South Cambridgeshire Forest and discovered that our members thought that was a great idea, but the landowners on whose land we wanted trees to be planted did not want to be farming in a forest or living in a forest. We rebranded this as the West Cambridge Hundreds after a sort of historical name for the area. We now have 26 farmers planting more trees on their own land and at their own expense and linking together the ancient woodlands that we actually manage. So by putting it across in a slightly different way, you get the local community on side and get people doing things for wildlife rather than seeing wildlife as a threat to their livelihoods, which is where the South Cambridge Forest got us. Now in the Great Fen, we have the great advantage of two existing national nature reserves. Each of those is about 200 hectares, so it's a sizable piece of habitat. Our intention is to acquire, to buy, the whole of the green area and we currently own the northern half and a bit down here. So 55% of that project area is already in conservation ownership. Uh, over half of it has already been managed for wildlife, and wildlife is starting to move out of these ancient fragments and habitat into newly restored wetlands. To show just how bleak it can be, these are some of those mirrors in Hogan National Nature Reserve. You remember I said Wittlesey Mirror, the big lake drained in the 1850s, these small lakes are where some of that wetland wildlife survived. And you can see that there's only about a 10 or 15 metre strip of trees between surviving mere and intensive arable land. That arable land will receive herbicides, insecticides, fungicides and fertilisers several times every year. And only a little spray drift and you're impacting on this internationally important wetland. The farm now belongs to the Wildlife Trust and the land is gradually being restored. So that we're putting buffers around, we're putting a strip down the side of these important wetlands to prevent impact from the outside onto the nature reserve. And most nature reserves suffer from these edge effects. If you go for a walk in bluebell wood in the spring, the first 50 or 100 metres into the wood, you won't have bluebells, you'll probably have things like steam nettles and goose grass, because the fertilisers drifting into the wood actually allow those plants to outcompete on those high nitrate soils. So they get in the way and they swamp the bluebells. What we can expect in the Great Fen, something like swallowtail butterfly were in the fens 100, 150 years ago, we could hope they may come back. 
Uh, I've been using this slide for a little while now, and spoonbills didn't breed in Britain when I first showed this. They've been breeding on the Norfolk coast for the last three years. They're now very likely to move into the Great Fen. Uh, blue throats aren't breeding in Britain this year, but they did breed in the north of England twice or three times in the 1990s. Just over the water in the Netherlands, there's a, a, a big wetland reserve on the coast. At that site, I, I should say the Dutch had no breeding blue throats um, until the 1980s. They created a 15,000 acre um, wetland reserve at Osvaldus Plassen. They now have 600,000 blue throats breeding on that nature reserve alone. So build the habitat and some wildlife will come. The, the token scarlet data there could be almost any European dragonfly that's within flying distance of the Great Fen. Create a large wetland, turn the temperature up, and exotic wildlife will arise. A bit closer to you here in the uh, crown field, this is the um, northern bit of the North Chilterns. You've got uh, Lutton and Dunstable over here, and the original trust reserves at Tottenham with this little polygon here and this strange shaped block here. That's the one I'll focus on because we've done a lot of research around there. The other areas outlined in white are high quality chalk habitats and much of the rest in between is fairly, or is or was, fairly intensive arable land. This is that little polygon that I highlighted. Just to give you a sense that a nature reserve isn't a single block of habitat for every species. And for those of you who aren't naturalists, this may actually be something you've not thought through before. Um, just to go back, we describe that as a chalk grassland nature reserve. And we lock it close and we see some chalk grassland. But over half the nature reserve is covered in bushes. It's hawthorn and blackthorn scrub. The chalk grassland plants and animals do not live in that. A different set of species breed there. There's uh, the good breeding population of turtle doves, the bird of conservation concern. But on that 28 acre nature reserve, perhaps a third of it is roughly chalk grassland. So two thirds of it is not habitat for chalk grassland species. Then we just look at the three typical butterflies of the area. The chalk hill blue has a single food plant, um, horseshoe vetch, and it needs its horseshoe vetch in fairly short turf, so where the grass is about that height. So much of that picture there, if the horseshoe vetch is present, which it probably is, would be habitat for the chalk hill blue. The small blue is easier to recognise its habitat. It breeds on a different food plant, kidney vetch, but it only breeds on kidney vetch overhanging bare chalk, where the kidney vetch warms up that bit faster in the spring and the early summer. So the white bits are potential habitat for the small blue. And look at that. We're now moving from the whole habitat as a nature reserve, a third of it as grassland, perhaps half of 1% or less than that as bare chalk. So in 28 acres, you can put the whole of the small blue butterfly's habitat maybe in this room or something twice the size of this room. And this is how it works for most species on most nature reserves. They are, that scarce of species tend to be ecological specialists, their habitat will be a tiny part of what's available. Now, if the motorbikes carry on and if the rabbits carry on, the small blue's habitat will stay in the same place. Those processes create bare chalk, the food plant overhangs the bare chalk, the small blue does okay. The Duke of Burgundy, one of the most rapidly declining of British butterflies, is a butterfly with a death wish. Its food plants are cowslips and primroses, primula species, but it will only lay eggs on large leaf primula uh, individuals and only on those in medium length grass, not too far from bushes. So in this picture, the potential habitat is a one metre strip round the edge there. Now, two or three problems with that. That one metre strip next to the bushes within five years will have been taken over by the bushes if we don't do something to knock them back. And unless we create other spaces with the right length turf, we won't be creating that habitat. Now this was once upon a time a woodland butterfly in Britain. It disappeared from woodlands in about 30 years in the mid 20th century because woodlands became a little bit too shady. It moved on to chalk downlands that have been uh, scrubbing approached for a short period was doing well. In the last 10 years, though, Tottenham is probably the only population in Britain that is increasing rather than decreasing because we've worked out what it likes. And now each winter, we knock back scrub from certain areas. But to point out how cheesy it is, this site has around 7,000 plants of primula. And in any one year, female uh, dukes lay their eggs only on between 50 and 70 individual plants. And there are certain plants that are so popular that three different female butterflies will lay their eggs on the same plant. So the caterpillars end up competing with each other for that one really favourite plant. 
But that's telling you that some like 99% of the plants are not seen as suitable egg laying sites for that butterfly. Now, if the average plant is that size and there's 70 of them in a good year which are suitable, you can imagine you could put the whole of that in an area maybe two meters <coughs> across. So, out of this nature reserve, which is what, about a kilometre long, the whole of the habitat for that butterfly, in terms of where it chooses to lay its eggs, would comfortably fit in there. And this is how many nature reserves are for many species. And that's why bigger nature reserves, with natural processes creating and adding dynamism to habitats, are likely to do the same good. As to what the future holds, well, these are two of the orchid species that don't currently grow in Bedfordshire. Uh, Lady orchid does occur in the extreme southeast of England. Uh, the yellow ophrys occurs in central and northern France. Both of those are orchid species produced fine dust like seeds which blow long distances. And my guess is that both of those species, probably another 50 non Bedfordshire orchids, have their seeds raining down on the North Chilterns most summers. And if the soil conditions are right and the soil fungi are right, those species could colonise Bedfordshire. And in the last 15 years, three new orchid species have arrived on the south coast of Britain probably windblown seeds from mainland Europe. So that we're not within range for these, if we create the habitats, the species may come. So bigger nature reserves gives a wider range of habitats and potentially bigger populations, better managed in the context of climate change, I'd tie into monitoring as well, because frankly, we don't know what the future holds, and we don't know whether our management is working. We do have though, in Britain, have some help at hand. This is Devil's Dyke in Cambridge here. Um, it's about 1,700 years old, and like any good ecological experiment, it was set up with replicates. So there's um, Devil's Dyke, Fleam Dyke, Bram Dyke, and Brent Dyke, all created at the same time, all created on chalk, all running more or less east-west, so they have a north and a south-facing slope. And that replicated ecological experiment allows us to look at wildlife in the long term and the short term. Now, one of my favourite groups, the mollusks, there is one species, the heath snail, Halus elvitala, which has disappeared from about 70% of chalk grasslands in Britain in the last 50 years, but survives on devil's dying. And I've been looking at their long enough for about 20 years, and get back one. In a hot, dry summer, heath snail breeds on the shaded north facing slope. In a cold, wet summer, it breeds on the hot, sunny south facing slope of devil's dying. And the difference between the two is about two equals crawl, the average snail so that you move from um, a hot sun breeding area to a cold sun breeding area in just two nights. So the species survives. If this were a flat chalk site, as many are, my guess is that it would have become extinct because there would have been hot suns when it couldn't breed, or there would have been cold suns when it can't breed. So that degree of topography makes a big difference. If you look at the plants and the animals within there, you will see that the sedentary species are quite different on the two sides of that slope. So 1,300 years is enough for the soil to take on different characteristics and to swap different flora and fauna. But the best example I can give you of how topography helps species is the large blue butterfly. Uh, now this has got one of the weirdest ecologies of any butterfly, so I'll talk you through it. Some of you will know the story already, I'm sure, but it's slightly peculiar. The female butterfly lays her eggs on the flowers of wild thyme. The egg hatches and the caterpillar feeds on the flowers. But in four or five days of landing there, though, and hatching, the caterpillar is picked up by one particular species of red ant. The red ant takes the caterpillar down into the nest of the ants, where the caterpillar ceases feeding on plants and becomes a predator. It becomes a small monster that feeds on baby ants. The caterpillar secretes sugar solution. Sugar is essentially a drug which ants are addicted to. The worker ants feed on the sugar excreted by the caterpillar. In return for that, they allow it to walk into the brood chamber and eat their youngsters, to the extent that if more than three caterpillars are taken into one ant nest, four or more caterpillars will eliminate the brood and the colony will collapse. So it's a serious predator, and only on sites where you have very high densities of red ant nests can you provide enough habitat for large blues to carry on feeding on the youngsters of the ants without eliminating the colonies. Now, large blue became extinct in Britain in the late 1970s and has since been reintroduced, but throughout the 20th century, all sites for large blues were hot, sunny, south facing chalk and limestone slopes. That was a place where you got big populations of the right species of red ant with wild thyme, and it survived. One of the mysteries is that in the 19th century, the best place in Britain to find large numbers of large blues 
was a meadow next to the river in the Nen Valley, not noted for its hot sunny south-facing slopes. And this was a puzzle until the great botanicologist Jeremy Thomas cracked the problem in the 1990s. And the answer is a different species of ant. Yellow meadow ant forms big anthills in riverside meadows. And if you go out with your teaspoon in the spring and dig a hole on the top of each of these anthills, you will find yellow meadow ants. They're no good to nice blue butterflies. But, and there, there's your yellow meadow ant with tiny black eyes, lives underground, doesn't go foraging for caterpillars, doesn't get, take caterpillars into its nest. But on the hot, sunny, south facing slope of the anthill, you will find colonies of red ants. And in a river and meadow like this, which has been there for centuries, the soil in the anthills tends to be slightly more calcareous and free draining than the rest of the meadow. You often find things like wild thyme growing on top of the hills, and on the sunny south facing slope, you will find the right species of red ant for large blue. So at uh, Bumble World in Northamptonshire, we believe yellow meadow ant transformed the landscape to provide these hot, sunny south facing slopes on which the red ant lived and inside whose nests the large blue butterfly survived. What it points out to me is that half a metre of topography is enough to have a hot, sunny south facing slope and a cool, shady, north-facing slope. You don't need mountains to have topography. And if we're designing nature as of these days with climate change in mind, we probably want to build in that sort of level of half-metre undulations to give us that hot and cool aspect to the wildlife. I've mentioned bluebells already, my story of the sad businessman. The problem bluebells face is one of the other factors on climate change. In a century's time, with a two degree temperature rise, tree species in our woodlands, oak and ash, will be opening their leaves six weeks earlier on a fridge. Bluebells, because of their genetic constitution, they're the biggest gene on the very British plant, bluebells can only shift their flowering period by about three weeks. And like most woodland flowers, they flower in the spring before the woodland becomes too shady. If the trees open the leaves earlier, the woodland will be too shady for bluebells. We'll lose the carpets of scented bluebells throughout our woods. And this will become a plant of woodland rides and blades and margins. But tie that into what I was saying earlier about um, drought and tree diseases and wind blow on trees. Our woodlands might actually turn out to have rather fewer trees in them anyway. And there'll be more grasslands there within which bluebells may do okay. Now, because we can't predict what's going to happen, this trust puts a lot of effort into monitoring. We have uh, an, an ecology groups team with 350 volunteers going out there monitoring wildlife, not always telling us what we want to hear. They may say, your management isn't working, but I'd rather find that out from the volunteers now than find out from the wildlife disappearing in 30 or 40 years' time. Talked a bit already about joining sites up, the uh, North Shields Chalk's a great example. We should be building this into our infrastructure. Whenever there's a new road or a new high-speed railway, there should be a linear habitat alongside it to link things together. The road on the rail will still be a barrier, but if you've got a decent corridor, there's some scope. Put this in there just to get you thinking about what we mean by a wildlife corridor. Imagine in your mind's eye two pieces of wood. Two woods, and we've got the wood on either side. You want to link them together, you put a hedgerow or a belt of trees between the two woods. Everybody happy with that so far? And that belt of trees allows woodland wildlife to move across from one wood to the other. Hey Preston, you have a wildlife corridor. However, that belt of trees is also a barrier to open ground species. It's been demonstrated in Meadowland, even a single strand of wire, let alone a narrow hedgerow, will be a barrier to butterfly dispersal. Butterflies fly along, they find a linear feature, and they either turn back or they go along the side of it. Some might go at the top, but if the Hedgerow becomes a shelter belt, the trees become more than about five metres high. Very few flying insects will go from one field to the next. So, a corridor for one set of species can be a barrier to a different set of species, unless your corridor is 20, 30, 40 metres wide, and like this one, which happens to be on a nature reserve. You've got open water, you've got wet grassland, you've got dry grassland, and you've got trees. If we can make our wildlife highways broad and diverse, they become corridors for a lot of different species to move through and perhaps even to breed within, rather than something that's a corridor for one habitat and a boundary or a barrier to others. And the final thoughts to leave you with, however good our wildlife trust in this area is in creating big habitats, this is a computer artist's impression of the Great Fen in another 50 years, 
even with 9,000 acres, 3,000 hectares of wildlife habitat, it won't be big enough for everything. Some of the Great Fens wildlife will be stuck in Kent and Sussex on the south coast of England if the London Wildlife Trust doesn't get its act together to allow those species to move through London into our area. And some Cambridge or Bedfordshire wildlife may need to be near the Scottish border in the century's time. So this needs to be a national vision. We need connectivity throughout the countryside, not just within individual counties. And just to make the point that it matters to people, the biggest health threat to Britain at the moment is related to inactivity. Getting people in the countryside is actually good for them. Uh, just walking in a wood is a great de-stressor. It's as effective as quite a lot of psychotropic drugs to make people feel better about themselves. This is actually, um, I mean, you can almost pick your city. This is the Doncaster floods from 2008, when thousands of houses were underwater. Twice as many houses would have been underwater if Pottery Carnage Reserve had hadn't taken half of the water. Wetland habitats for wildlife are great places to store water. Most people would rather flood the nature reserve than flood their homes. The Great Fen is a great place to store flood water in emergencies. And we've got many demonstrations that natural uh, floodplains are the best way to both slow down and to minimise long-term flooding risks. Um, does not have a hobby horse in mind here. Britain is uniquely important in Europe for its peatlands, both upland and lowland. Uh, peat is one of our major long-term carbon storages and stores. Um, on a site like this, in, it's actually, I think it's actually Western Ireland, we might have something like 10 metres of peat in the ground, maybe seven or 8,000 years of carbon dioxide accumulation. And it's a sort of place where people might want to put wind turbines. Now, in a landscape like that, each of those turbines will have a 25 metre cube of concrete at its base, completely destroying the hydrology of the body that is being put across. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't support wind farms, but I'm saying that with every development, and certainly every um, low carbon energy source, we should have a lifetime carbon budget for the project. To say, well, each of these turbines will live, will have a functional life of 30 years, the first five years will be paying back the carbon needed to manufacture it, the next 20 years may be paying back the carbon that is destroyed by releasing carbon from feedlock. So suddenly, uh, a low carbon energy source becomes a high carbon energy source. Uh, another big scheme that's talked about a lot at the moment is the idea of seven barrage. If you look into the current schemes of seven barrage, they also include building a motorway across the top of the barrage and an airport at one end of it to make the scheme viable. I don't think the motorway and the airport make the seven barrage a low carbon scheme. So, a plea for lifetime carbon budgets for every major development. Now, the one I've just been talking about landscape scale since the mid-1990s, just before the last election, Professor Sir John Walton, leading ecologist, chairman of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, led a review called Vacant Space for Nature, commissioned by the Labour government, accepted by the coalition. The Walton review basically said, bigger, better, joined up, new sites and less pressure. And a white paper came out two years ago saying much the same. And that's all it did. It said we should be doing something about this. Two years on, we're still waiting. Big problem in Britain, politicians confuse environment, business, recession, economy. There's a sense in this country at the moment that economic growth is an alternative to environmental protection. There's no sense that actually if you don't get the environment right, you will not have the economic basis, you won't have the people actually to have the industrial growth that you need. This was originally painted as a Russian artist's impression of the Great Fen in maybe two or three hundred years. I now see these as cranes moving either from Northamptonshire or Bedfordshire wetlands into the Great Fen before they move on to the next set of big wetlands that Wildlife Trust will be creating elsewhere in Britain. It needs to be a national project, but we started it on our patch. We've got nine living landscape schemes moving forward. And I think we can make wildlife adapt to a two degree temperature rise. We may be able to help it adapt to a three degree temperature rise. Beyond that, I don't think people will be caring about wildlife. They'll have far too many problems of their own. So, on that somewhat gloomy note, <laughs> pray for a two degree temperature rise max and support your local wildlife trust to adapt to it. Thank you very much.
obviously reintroducing native species that have died out or doing something about invasive species that shouldn't be there, like those mussels? Am I allowed to say no? <laughs> I think actually restoring habitat and reconnecting landscapes is much more important than dealing with individual species issues. Um, in the medium term, I think um, diseases of trees and of other keystone plant species may turn out to be really rather important. So that rather than trying to eradicate mink or um, zebra mussels, I'd be looking for far better national biosecurity to prevent the importation of plant diseases. Now that's also going to be important for agriculture and horticulture as well. But from my point of view, we haven't many tree, uh, forest tree species left that are not subject to a recently arrived lethal disease. So I think blocking the importation of diseases is probably higher on the list than anything. Uh, my own sense is that if you've got big, resilient natural habitats, then invasive species don't have to do a great deal of damage. Classic cases, we're looking at mink. Of most global Britain, mink have eliminated water bowls. In the fens, where we still have a very dense network of ditches, there are mink and there are water bowls living side by side because there's enough water bowl habitat that the mink can't find anymore. So get the habitat right, and you need to worry a lot less about invasive species. I'm at my first forestry lecture um, sometime in the middle of the last century. Uh, I forestry lecturer got up and said, Oakwood, that's going to do for us. Mm -hmm. About three years later, we were in the middle of Dutch elm disease, um, and, and now we're getting ash dieback. Um, and you were mentioning Oakwoods again. Is this something yep. which will take out the oak trees? Of, of, of uh, potentially, yes. And we're already seeing sudden oak death on quite a few of our reserves. It tends to be the odd tree here and there at the moment, and we don't know why. And it may be. Um, and with some tree disease, there's a small proportion of the population sensitive to the rest of not. With ash dieback, we think maybe 80 or 90 percent are vulnerable, 10 or 15 or 20 percent may be more resilient. With Dutch elm disease, it was more like 99.9 percent that succumbed. Very interesting with Dutch elm disease, uh, although mature trees were killed, suckering elms survived, so that the insect fauna associated with the tree species are still there and doing fine. But what we don't see is the uh, landscape impact of elm trees. I mean, I'm just old enough to remember landscapes where elms were dominant trees. Nowadays, I can think of a few places where there are a few surviving trees. So I'm guessing if we've overworld, it may be around the 50% fatality level from what we've seen so far, with ash die about probably above, above 90%. One of the differences is that ash seeds incredibly well, so that if, you, if you kill one ash tree, it will quickly be surrounded by 100,000 seedlings a few of which are probably going to be resistant to the disease. With oak, um, oak regeneration within woodland is actually very poor in this country. So it may be that if we lose our forest oaks, they're quickly replaced either by ash, in some places these days probably more like sycamore, which is not a good insect feeding tree. Sycamore's a rather boring tree, really, but better off now it is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, well, it's insectism. We, we need more insect. Sycamore feeds aphids, oaks feed three or four hundred other species too. And most of our spring songbirds feed on caterpillars on oak trees. Ash, oddly enough, is not a very good insect tree either. So if we lost ash and oak took over from it, then we'd have rather more wildlife in our woods, I suspect. Any more questions? What. Um you mentioned that we're quite a large, we've got quite a large campus here. Um, what should we be doing as a university from the Wildlife Trust point of view to uh, help sustain biodiversity while still being able to operate as a university and we do have a thing like an airport there as well, I would say. Yeah, well, something that quite a lot of house developers house developers is that at the moment we have a lot of grass out here. I'm guessing it's mown six or eight times a year. And it's very, and it's very significant. Mowing it is expensive. Yes. Um, letting it grow up and flower and turning it into a meadow that is cut once a year will save you hundreds of thousands of pounds of grass cutting. And if people don't like it and then they enter a trick, the answer is to put up a little sign saying experimental meadow. <laughs> but as soon as the sign saying it's deliberate, people get used to it. Our own office is at Campbell in an area uh, that the house builders are only building on 40% of Campbell, 60% of its green space, and most of that green space 
is now on an annual pay cut. And apart from all the little bits of um, sports pitch and village greens, we don't have the six or eight or ten times a year gang area. And we have vastly more wildlife. We have the most productive skylark populations in Britain on some of the rough grass of the Camborne. And the residents love it. They'd far rather be living in a nature reserve than in a country park. And the shift from short grass country parkism to long grass nature reserve actually suits people very well indeed. That's really pleasing to hear because we're just starting to experiment with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but do put up little signs of why yes. people complain. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. OK, fine. Um, there's no, no more questions. I'm really pleased that we've actually got this whole film so people who couldn't actually make it have got the opportunity to see it as well. Very, very informative, right? Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. And can we finally introduce Georgina, who haven't met Georgina, who's the one of trust promoter? Yeah. <laughs> Memberships support the work, and especially for the next generation, anyone who's got youngsters in the family, please find out about what we do for kids because we're living at a time when youngsters aren't getting out and discovering nature like we did when we were kids, and it's really, really important to nurture that so that when we pass all this on to them in the future, they actually care about it as much as we do. So please do come and uh, have a look at what we've got. Thank you.